Welcome to our final session on covenant theology, and specifically, we are looking at part two of our understanding of the covenant of grace. So by way of reminder, in our last session, we talked about how the covenant of grace was promised throughout the Old Testament and, and revealed in farther steps throughout the Old Testament. But now, in this session, we are actually going to look at how the covenant of grace is established and inaugurated, specifically in what commonly Scripture refers to as the New Covenant. So, John, why don't you, just to kind of give us some uh, some some things to talk about a little bit, give yeah. us a, a good reminding definition of the covenant of grace. Right. So the covenant uh, always has parties involved. So we have two parties involved. You have God who's initiating the covenant. He's giving the covenant. And then you have the recipients of the covenant, which is the elect, those to whom he, uh, in the covenant of redemption, chose before the foundation of the world. What makes this uh, covenant unique is that it is an unconditional covenant. That means that it's unconditional to salvation. So so what God is promising to do in the covenant is to save the elect, and there's nothing left for them to do. They are parties, or they are in this um, covenant by faith through grace alone because of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, what we're going to be working with. Now, there is some distinctions, and Mm -hmm. the New Testament often compares the old versus the new to help you understand why the new is needed exactly and how the old is a shadow of the new so let's start there so what is it that makes the new covenant new right is a good question to ask when we talk about the old covenant just by way of clarification that we understand to be comprised of the abrahamic covenant the mosaic covenant and the davidic covenant so those three covenants together make up what would be referred to even in the new testament as the old covenant right and that covenant, as compared to the new, it was a, a covenant of temporal blessing, not mm-hmm. eternal blessing. That's right. And it was a covenant that was conditioned upon obedience rather than it being unconditional, grounded in the grace of God in Christ Jesus in to Christ's the Christ's obedience. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Justin, would you mind just explaining, what do you mean by temporal blessing? Yeah. Temporal meaning in like earthly and in this life. That's right. Yeah. yeah, there was an end to it. In other words, the promises of the Old Covenant had a, had an end in it. The promises of the New Covenant have no end in sight. They're right. eternal. They are eternal. Right. So, so as we consider the New Covenant and the Old, as we compare the two, some good places to start, guys. We In the Old Covenant, there is circumcision, and we may talk more about this later. But in the New Covenant, we see the fulfillment of circumcision, which is the right. circumcision of the heart. I mean, if we're mindful of Moses' words in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6, he says that the Lord will circumcise your hearts. I mean, so this promise exists a long, long time ago, Mm -hmm. and then it's realized in the new covenant, in the covenant of grace, as we understand it. And I would add to that, just this is a great, as we have been talking about throughout the series, this is a great type and shadow, right? right? So they are, there's a cutting away of the flesh, and then there is identification with the spirit i'm sorry with uh with the uh, the community or the covenant in the new covenant it is the cutting away of the heart or it's bringing in a heart of flesh right right and then this is also making you part of the identification of this new covenant community no that's right and we'll talk more about that in a minute Mm -hmm. Uh, another big thing to say is that the new covenant is and again when we say the new covenant that is synonymous for us in terms of the, the covenant of grace established is the new covenant. That's right. Right. So it's no longer being promised. That's right. It's, it's not reality. just promised and revealed. It's established, inaugurated, accomplished. We have know, received it, it right. through Christ in the new covenant. So it is grounded upon not our obedience, but it's grounded upon the obedience of Christ received by faith. That's why it's called grace. Right. Right. And I want to be clear here because a lot of people, I think, confuse faith with a work. That faith is sure. still something that we need to conjure up within ourselves. Yeah. And it's so important, and, and the New Testament is very clear on this, that faith itself is a gift. Faith itself is something that God bestows. Right? The writer of the Hebrews talks about how Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith, mm-hmm. that, that Jesus is the one who finds us. Jesus is the one who initiates towards us. Jesus is the one who bestows faith in our hearts. And so 
we have to remember when we say covenant of grace, we truly mean of grace. That's right. That even exactly. faith itself is a gift of grace bestowed on no, our heart. That's entirely right. So yeah. another thing that we could talk about is the the new covenant, the covenant of grace, is characterized by an indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in us. That's right. So this is the language of Ezekiel 36, where God promises in the new covenant to put his spirit within his people. So this was not true before. The, the Spirit of God was upon people. There was certainly an anointing of particular persons for particular tasks. The Spirit of God would have been with the people, but the Spirit of God now lives in us That's right. in the new covenant. So in that sense, it's new. And he specifically says in Ezekiel that he will. the Spirit causes us to actually have the capacity to obey, sure. whereas the law was there to govern them. Now the Spirit is here to govern us. And the law of God, to pick up on that, does not only exist outside of us in the new covenant. The law of God has now been written on our hearts Mm -hmm. and huge. The law has been fulfilled for us. So it no longer condemns us. It no longer threatens us. Mm. It is our kind advisor to use Calvin's language. And that's because of what Jesus has done. And now it's been written on our hearts and we have become obedient from the heart. Mm. Romans chapter six, verse 17, right? Right. Because of the indwelling reality of the Holy spirit and the law being written there. Mm. And we now delight in the law of God in our inner man, Romans seven. Right. Yeah, so these are all the benefits of what we know of the the covenant. And it's unconditional, right. meaning that in the old covenant, they obeyed, they received land promises, they received protection. In the new covenant, Christ obeys, and we receive justification, meaning that our sins are forgiven, mm. and the perfect obedience of Jesus is given to us. That's our justification. Then we receive sanctification, which is the Holy Spirit coming in and changing us as we wait for the most important promise, which is our glorification, right? Yeah, the moment we will then be fully transformed into the into the into the image of uh, image of Christ. Yeah. So, like, what are the benefits of the covenant of grace? Full stop. I mean, eternal life. That's right. Nothing short of it. You know, right. it, like eternal life, meaning you have it now, and you will have it in the future. Right. Yeah, I think if we were to summarize the Christian life, or if I were to summarize the Christian life, I would say this. You know, in what's given to us, the benefits of the covenant of grace. Sanctification is getting used to our justification. Yeah. Sanctification is living in such a way as God has already called us to be. That's right. 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 That that God right. has said, you are my son. And in alignment with the identity we already have. Exactly. Right. To be justified means to be declared right. That that God in the cosmic courtroom has said, because of Christ's merits, I declare you right in my eyes. Sanctification is a lifelong process of one, well, actually it's definite, right? We have been set apart by God, but also it's a continual setting apart. We're getting used to that idea of justification while we await what? While we await the glorious resurrection of our physical bodies or the return of Christ, and we are glorified and we live in the presence of God for eternity. And so these are the benefits. And, and, and frankly, when we have a covenantal understanding of Scripture, when we truly begin to kind of steep ourselves in this covenant of grace, these categories, these things become less of realities that we need to conjure up within ourselves Mm. and more of resting place, resting Mm. places that we see that God has freely given us in the gospel, in the covenant of grace. Right. Well, the story begins in Eden. And what did they lose in Eden? They lost their innocence. They failed their obedience and they are no longer in the presence of God. Mm. What, The old covenant never promised to restore that. The new covenant is the promise of the Mm -hmm. full restoration of innocence, righteousness, and the presence of God here on earth again. Well, the presence of God, I mean, I wasn't even planning to say this now. It just comes to mind. The very last verse of Ezekiel, when in talking about that city that will come, Mm -hmm. and it will be called the Lord is there. Right. It's remarkable. Yeah, well, even Isaiah, it talks about Isaiah 11, that the presence of the Lord will be with his people. So in thinking about some of the things you guys have just said, I'm going to go ahead and and read a text that I was planning to read later because I think it just fits beautifully now. Mm -hmm. In thinking about the nature of the new covenant and the covenant of grace and the certainty that is a part of this for all those who are under it. Hebrews 10 beginning verse 11, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So that's an old covenant reality. Right. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down because it's over. 
waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. And then this, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. It, it, that is so rock solid, airtight, and certain. Hmm. Like this, this is covenant of grace language, that we have been perfected for all time. It's as good as done, and we are being sanctified. So it, the idea that there would be people under the covenant of grace who that is not true for is, is not a biblical no. teaching. It's no, and to contrast idea. that with the Old and the New Testament, we'll get into this later, but to contrast it with the Old, um, Paul says multiple times, all of the children of Israel of the, that come from, come from Abraham, they're not all the children of God. They're not all the, the spiritual children. So, spiritual. Right. right. So in one covenant, you have people who do believe by faith in the promise and those who do not. Well, this is important. Very briefly, we, we said the, the new covenant is unconditional and eternal. We could also say it is spiritual. That's right. In, in that regard. That's right. Right. It's not physical, meaning it's, it's not a, a biological, physical seed reality. Mm-hmm. It's a spiritual seed reality. Those who, for example, Galatians 3, 7, who are of faith are the children of Abraham spiritually. Right. Which the listener will understand some of what we mean from things that we've said in previous sessions. Right, which, which makes the new covenant necessary. Right. Yeah. So we, we're beginning to move there. We've, we're, we're talking about the distinctions that we see between the new and the old covenant. I just want to read a couple verses from Hebrews chapter 8, where the writer of the mm. Hebrews says this in chapter 8, verse 6, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better. Mm since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Mm -hmm. For he finds fault when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, Mm -hmm. when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So clearly, in the New Testament's mind, if you will, if I could personify the New Testament, there is a sharp distinction between the new and old covenant. Now, we've talked about types and shadows. And so maybe now let's have a conversation of how these types and shadows that we saw in the Old Covenant that we've talked about for almost four sessions now find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. Right. And I will say to that verse, the moment that God inaugurates or begins to promise the covenant of grace, there, when the Old Covenant was given, there was always the anticipation of the new one because the old was never designed to bring salvation. No, it was not. The old was designed to set up salvation. Which exactly. is what we're going to talk about. It, it, to to reveal, it was designed to reveal it. That's right. Right. It it was designed to reveal the coming redemption of the Lord. That's right. One verse to go ahead and read now, as we're getting ready to launch into this types and shadows conversation, mm-hmm. is Second Corinthians one twenty. For all the promises of God, and by all, I assume Paul means all. Right. Right. For all the <laughs> right. promises of God find their yes in Him, being Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Hmm. Right. Right. So basically that's that's what we're going to start talking about now is how all the promises of God, in particular, all the promises of God as it relates to salvation, Mm -hmm. find their yes and their amen in Christ. Right. Right. So you have when you when you begin to see the the formation of the old covenant, the original covenant that was made to establish. You have a people that are being established. The purpose of those peoples, according to Abraham, is that from him all the nations of the world will be blessed, and there's a seed coming. And then you get into the uh, old—I can remember the first time I began to discover covenant theology and reading the Mosaic Covenant, Christ became glorious because I, for the first time, understood what prophet, priest, and king, those titles to Jesus meant. Before, it was like, yeah, somehow— that's connected to the Old Testament. I don't really know how. Well, the relationship that Israel has with the priest is very important to them because they cannot continue to live in the land. They cannot be in the presence of God unless they have their sins temporally covered. And what is Christ described as? The final and ultimate priest, right? He is the one who is the mediator. He goes between God and us. And so he becomes himself the sacrifice that is necessary. So when John in 129, when he, when John the Baptist sees Jesus walking towards him, he gives you 
the explanation of the shadow of the lamb that's being constantly on the day of atonement crucified, what does he say? Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the shadow that these people lived underneath for thousands of years, what John is saying, this is it. Mm -hmm. The, the picture of the final sacrifice, which you have seen year and year and year and year after year. Yeah. The substance of it, Right. The anti-type is what we said. The right. type versus that. The, it is it is standing before you right. now. The the prototypical prophet in in the Old Testament. I mean, we Elijah is significant, no doubt. Right. But the prototypical prophet in the Old Testament is Moses. Right. And we could also say that that Moses depicts also for us the role of a mediator. Right. And Moses himself says in Deuteronomy eighteen verses fifteen and following, "The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me." from among you, from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Verse 18 of Deuteronomy 18. The Lord is saying this. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Right. So we see Jesus come on the scene in this sense as the, the prophet, the That's greater right. Moses. And this is, this is the, the, the language of the writer to the Hebrews. Like Jesus is greater than everything. That's right. He's he's greater than Moses, right? He's a son, right? He's not a servant. He's a son. He is he is the prophet of God's people, and he is the mediator. He's also better than Aaron, which is the priesthood, which we can talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. et cetera. Jimmy, yeah. go ahead. Well, as we think about prophet, what what was the role of a prophet? The prophet was a mouthpiece for God. That's right. And actually, I think one of the greatest passages we have that depicts Jesus as a prophet, we often don't think of one, is actually John chapter one, mm -hmm. where no doubt John introduces Jesus how? That in the beginning was the, the word, word. <laughs> right? The message, the word. Yeah. That, that Jesus himself becomes the word, the living word, the living message to God's people. In the beginning was the word, and the word was, was with God, and the word was God. So John, in John's mind, I think clearly he understands that Jesus is the final fulfillment. Jesus is the great prophet that has come to bring God's words to God's people. That's right. I mean, John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. Well, who is that? That's, Je that's, that's Jesus. the word. That's the divine word, the that's divine right. logos. That's Correct. God the Son Yes, made flesh. He has made him known. That's so right. in that sense, yes. And it's the language of Hebrews 1, the introduction to the letter of the Hebrews. Like God, in various times and various ways, he spoke to us by the prophets and all this stuff. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Mm. Right. Yeah. Amen. And I know we spent a, quite a bit of time last on our last episode on Jesus as king. So I don't think we yep. need to. But I mean, the whole, we, uh, the promises to Abraham, uh, we f fuller explained and uh, identified in in uh, mosaic and then the davidic king the davidic covenant all of those are pushing us towards the ultimate king the final king the real king of kings which is christ yeah. so but, but can i talk about the priesthood real quick absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Right. absolutely so jesus so we've talked about the you know the offices of prophet priest and king and we did spend a lot of time as you said john on the king piece how jesus is the greater david who would mm -hmm. come and represent the nation would represent god's people and as would, goes the heart of the king, so goes, as, the, so nation. goes the nation. And would accomplish righteousness for them right. and would be the satisfaction for their sins and would represent them. But then thinking about the, the role of the priesthood, again, in the letter to the Hebrews, it's just replete with language of how Jesus is greater than Aaron and how he is, he is a high priest of his people. Right, He sympathizes with us in our weakness, but he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, meaning that he, he didn't really, like Melchizedek just kind of shows up and doesn't have this like lineage and everything else. Like Jesus shows up and is an eternal high priest. And then these words are, are remarkable from Hebrews 7. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. So the priests died. Hmm. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently. It's because he has an indestructible life. Right. right, that the, the writer had said that earlier. He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 
Like, thank God for Jesus, who is this kind of high priest. That's right. Unshakable life, lives forever, continues on forever to intercede for his own, to mediate, and to reconcile us to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's think about these roles, prophet, priest, and king, in the Old Testament or under the Old Covenant. In a summarizing way, prophets revealed God's words and God's will to God's people. Priests, through the sacrificial system, atoned for the sins of God's people, Mm -hmm. and kings ruled over God's people. Mm -hmm. Now, these all find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ, that he fulfills all three of these roles himself, that Jesus comes, and in his earthly ministry, what does he do? As the word, as the message, he reveals God's heart and God's will to God's people. But he's also the great high priest who himself, through his own blood, his own death, atones for the sins of God's people, but then is raised, glorified, seated at the right hand of God, as where he says in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me. That's kingly language. It is, right. All authority has been given to me. So Jesus speaks God's will to God's people, but he he atones for the sins of God's people, and now he has been raised to be the king of God's people, not under the old covenant, Right. but rather underneath the new. That's right. right. So we said early on in this series that everyone in all of the world has only been saved by faith in Christ. That's right. By faith in the promised seed. That's right. So yeah. in the Old Testament, they believed that God would fulfill his promise to redeem them. Yeah. And in in uh, just to kind of add what Jimmy is saying, you have Paul who's like, all the shadows are gone, the substance is here. Exactly. So he says this in Romans 3. 23 and following, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the garden, and are justified mm-hmm. by his grace as a gift, coming out of grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the fulfillment right. of all the shadows, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to receive by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in right. his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. So the blood of bulls and goats is what the temporary passing over that he's talking of. So the 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 shadows, the children of Israel, those in the old covenant, they mm-hmm. looked for the moment when God would bring the final sacrifice. That's and Paul right. is saying here that those of the old were not saved by the old covenant. That's right. They were saved by the new, yep. looking forward to right. the promise. And Paul is saying now in the new, yep. saying it has retrospectively moving back. Exactly. And there. retrospectively, we would understand that all of the benefits of Christ are applied to Old Testament saints. That's right. And that matters. That language Absolutely. is important. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that even as they were trusting the promises of God realized in Messiah, based upon the revelation that they had, right, the benefits of Christ were, were counted to them. Right. Yeah. That's good. And this can be very confusing for people because... There, there can be, when we misunderstand Scripture, a, a little bit of cognitive dissonance. But I think a simple way of putting it is this. In the same way that we, who are saints in Christ today, look back to the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as our grounds of salvation and assurance, right. the saints of old looked forward to the promises of God to be yes. revealed finally in Jesus Christ, even if they did not see it. And so we look back, they looked forward. But what's important is that very definite time in history Hmm. when Christ fulfilled all that needed to be fulfilled in his life and his death and resurrection. Yeah. And so, as we've said, when you arrive in the New Covenant, when you come to the Gospel accounts and Jesus shows up on the scene, everything that came before, they were types and shadows. There were promises, there was revelation, but the covenant of grace itself accomplished and established is happening as Messiah shows up on the scene. Mm -hmm. And we are no longer in types and shadows territory. The real thing has come. And the point of all the promises that were made is now here. And even like Galatians 3.16 is a significant verse. We talked a lot about Abraham in the previous session, but to see there the language of Paul, that he understands that the promises God made to Abraham, and by promise, we would we would understand the unconditional promise right. that God made to Abraham. It is realized through the promised offspring, right? So it's not the, the physical children of Abraham. It is the promised offspring, namely Christ, who will fulfill and accomplish all of these things for all of Abraham's spiritual children. Yeah. Another verse 
which is uh, connected to that is Romans 15, 8, where he says, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. So the purposes of Israel is to bring us Christ and to fulfill the promises, as he says, to the patriarchs. Yeah, and the purpose of the nation of Israel is to save the nations, plural. Right, not just Israel. Right. That's right. But just a brief thought. Yeah, like we, Israel had a purpose, and that purpose is now fulfilled as Christ shows up on the scene. It matters that, that we would say this. A lot of times the, the perception of many people is that Israel was the point or is the point, hmm. and the church is kind of the parenthesis. That's right. Whereas we would we would say, well, actually, it's the, the opposite, that the church, meaning the people of God from every tribe, language, nation, around the throne of God in the new heaven and the new earth, that was always the point. That is That's the right. point. And Israel is, is the parenthesis. That's right. Israel is the vehicle through which Messiah comes and through which the nations will be saved. Well, and, and that's really the promise that's made to Abraham, that through him, through his offspring, the nations of the world would be blessed. That is what we are seeing in ultimate fulfillment, as you mentioned in Revelation, where we have members of God's people from every tribe and every tongue and every language and every nation around the throne of God because of the Lamb of God who was slain to take away their sins. That's right. So we want to be very clear that Israel's purpose was to bring us the Messiah. That's right. Yeah. And that was accomplished at the coming of Christ. <laughs> and now this is where you start to see Paul use language, that the beautiful mystery of the gospel is that they now, under the new covenant, are welcoming the Gentiles, that it is no longer just the nation of Israel but rather it becomes God's people. That's right. From every tribe. It becomes God's people from every nation. Right. Israel yeah. has served its purpose. Israel as a nation, but the people of God. So sometimes you hear this language like somehow we believe that God replaces Israel with the church. No. No, it's no. It's fulfillment. It's fulfillment, right. So right. God's adding to these people Correct. of God. And now there is a structure by which he doesn't work within the nation now. Right. He works within the local church. He works, of course, the global church. But God's mission now is being fulfilled in the local church with his people, the people of God, a part yeah. of this new covenant. Right. The, that's that's the fulfillment of it, or it's right. finding its completion. And, and And this is why, guys... Like we talked in a previous session about the idea of a theocracy or God setting up a, a nation under God's God's law, but what what we see in the new covenant is is how does God rule? Well, He rules by by the Spirit through the hearts of His people, mm. right? This is how God extends His kingdom is through through the means of the the preaching of the gospel through the local church. Sinners are converted unto Christ by faith or by grace mm-hmm. through faith. And, and this is how God's rule is now extended. It's Absolutely. no longer through conquering nations right. by the sword, but yeah. but rather, I mean, if if you want to be kind of funny about it, rather it's the sword of the Spirit cutting through the hearts right. of sinners. His word, exactly right. right. That that comes through, and and that is how God's kingdom now expands. So another thing that we should talk about in how the old covenant and the new covenant are different, how mm-hmm. there's a distinction between the two. They're not the same. How new is the new covenant? How new is the new covenant? They're not the same. Right. This would be the conversation about how it is that the people of God are marked off. Yeah. So in the old covenant, again, represented Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic covenants that comprise the old covenant, the people of God were marked off how? By circumcision. circumcision. Yeah. In the new covenant, the covenant of grace, as we are arguing for, the people of God are marked off by something different. It is by regeneration, namely the circumcision of the heart. So we've mentioned Jeremiah. a great example of a type. Exactly, a type and a fulfillment, right? right? So we've talked about Jeremiah 31, where God says he's going to make a new covenant, and one of the things he promises to do is write his law on the hearts of his people, and he, he says no one will have to say to his, his brother, These covenant members. know the Lord, yeah. because they'll all know me. Mm-hmm. Ezekiel 36, I'll put my spirit in you. I'll give you a new heart, right? And then Galatians 3, 2 and 3, just very briefly, guys, 
Paul asks this question. Let me ask you only this to the Galatian Christians. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? But in particular, this question of, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by faith? And people who are familiar with the context of Galatians know that the main work of the law that keeps coming up over and over again is circumcision. Mm -hmm. So did you... Did you receive the Spirit by, by circumcision? Well, no. Did you become a part of the people of God by circumcision? No. That's right. How did you become a part of the people of God? Well, it was by faith. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and we, we understand that regeneration and faith, they, they go together. That regeneration, right. the new birth, is what produces faith mm. in, in Christ. Colossians 2, 11 would be another way Paul describes this. He says, in him... Also, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, right? So he's using the type to give you the, or the shadow to give you this example. By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power of the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So he's using illustration of marking a group off of people. Mm -hmm. You are now the people of God because you have died with Christ Mm -hmm. and been raised with him. And you've been circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. And going on in Colossians 2, you were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven you your sins. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between those who were a part of the Abraham covenant, those who are part of the nation of Israel, you did not have to have a regenerate heart in order to be a part of that nation and have those blessings. But what we're being described here in this new covenant and this community of this covenant, they have a new heart, right? They are the ones who have been gone from death to life. Well, and, and just to, to go back to Abraham, mm-hmm. it's, it's important to remember, I mean, think of, can you imagine being Abraham and God gives him the covenant of circumcision and you're like, I have to do what now? <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. But, but again, as we go throughout the old Testament, it's farther steps further revealed that eventually what we see is under the old covenant, under the old covenant, people were marked off mm-hmm. by circumcision. But now as Jeremiah says, as Ezekiel says, as we see the new Testament, right. Writers talk about, we are marked off by the Spirit's work in our hearts to circumcise, quote-unquote, the foreskin of our hearts. That's right. The hardness of our hearts. Mm. That, 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 is, that is how God's Amen. people are now identified. And so it's kind of like you hear this collective, oh, from heavens, <laughs> from the heavens, <laughs> as Abraham is like, I get it. Right. I see it. I didn't see it clearly then, right. but I believed God, and it was counted to me as exactly. righteousness. That's right. But now... It finds its ultimate fulfillment. In yeah. So even the language of Jesus in John chapter three, when he talks to Nicodemus, mm-hmm. he says that I, I tell you, unless one is born again or born from above, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't see my kingdom. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on two verses later in verse five to say that unless one is born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter my kingdom. Well, what's that water and the spirit a reference to? It's Ezekiel 36. That's right. It's Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27 where God says, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. But but before that, the water piece, I will sprinkle clean water on Mm. you, right? And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Born of the water of the water and the spirit, it's it's like Jesus is saying this that you will not enter my it. kingdom. If you want to be a part him. of my kingdom, you will be you will experience this reality. Mm. Yeah, and I just want to be really clear here, almost as like an aside, that I think a lot of times people can hear this language and they can say, "Wow, this just seems so like odd and mysterious and spiritual." And how do I know? And how can I be sure? And, and I don't think that's what the writers of the scriptures are trying to do in our, in our hearts and minds. But rather, what I think they're seeking to do is to bring us confidence and assurance and peace and joy that Absolutely. this is what God does. This is God's work. This is not something that we conjure up in and of ourselves. I, I, Justin, you like to say all the time, hey, can you tell me, can you, can you change your own heart? Well, and the, right. the answer to that is an emphatic no. 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 That, that something outside of you needs to right. come within and change your heart. Word. And this is what the scriptures are declaring. Yeah. It's like, no, you can't, but God can. Yeah. 
Exactly. Right. And this is why we see it in a sharp juxtaposition against right. the law. Right. Because the law says do this and live. Right. 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 Yeah, and and the old covenant says be circumcised and be a part of the people of God. That's right. And the new covenant says be born again, which God will do for you. Exactly right. right. Well, even in the Old Testament, they had signs that pointed towards what was going to happen. And now we new covenant members, we have signs that point us back to remind us and strengthen us. And we call them means of grace. Yeah. But baptism right. and the Lord's table are two physical realities that right. are pictures, perfect pictures where the spirit comes and strengthens our faith to remind us what did happen. Yeah. And, and let's talk about those for a moment, because I think a lot of times we can be almost a little bit Gnostic that we reject anything physical. Mm-hmm. But sure. when, when you, when you see the writer's, of the New Testament talk about baptism, it's not like baptism didn't come out of nowhere. No, I, I think that's kind of a common misnomer. But what do we see? We see in the Exodus, they, sure. they walk through the judgment waters that's out right. of slavery. That's right. Right. <laughs> and, and they become a new people. Well, Noah. This, is, this, this is exactly what we see now. Yeah. That, sure. That the, the waters of baptism, they, they point us to this reality that we have mm-hmm. been buried with Christ mm-hmm. in his death. Yeah, but we are raised with Christ to new life, and and the Lord's table, that's not weird. <laughs> I mean, that's right. that's that's the Passover. That's right. 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 That 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 Jesus says. Yeah, type and, and shadow, yeah, like type and, and shadow, and then fulfillment. And I, yeah. A lot of people, I don't think, realize this. Where what? How was the world fallen into sin <laughs> through eating? <laughs> and yet, sure. Jesus takes that and says, "No, Satan, you're not going to take yeah. that from my people." Right. Where the serpent said to Adam and Eve take this, eat this, take this and eat, and you will be like God. Jesus says, take and eat and taste and see yeah. that the Lord is good and his yeah. steadfast love endures forever. Yeah, the baptism, you have, been, you have been washed and cleansed and buried and resurrected and united to Christ Jesus, and you're in him, mm. right? The Lord's Supper, it's like, yeah, it happens. It's instituted literally as Passover is occurring. Like, right. You cannot make this up. I mean, right. Christ is, is, it's Passover. He's eating a meal with his disciples, he's going to die the next day. And he starts to use this language of, this is my body broken for you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Mm -hmm. Like my blood is what is accomplishing this new covenant. And it is the seal of it in that sense. Right. And so now take and eat and receive what I am doing for you. Yeah. And and have done for you. Exactly right. And, and, and John, you use the language of means of grace that you know, lest we get left in subjective swamp, <laughs> God doesn't right. do that. He no. says, no, 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 I've given you these physical means yes. so that as surely as the water has yes. gone over you, you can you can trust that the washing of the regeneration Amen. of the Holy Spirit is, is there. As surely I mean, as that bread and wine goes into your mouth, yep. right. Christ I mean, has is, done this for you. Exactly that is right. the language of Colossians. He says, having been buried with him in baptism, right? That's right. the cleansing. And then he right. says, in which you were also raised with him right. through faith. And I think it's important here that he is pointing to people, like he's giving them, if you're in the covenant, these are your realities. Yeah. Your realities. And, and the, the sacraments, guys, of baptism and the Lord's Supper, I think it's great that we're talking about this. What are they about? I, I mean, if, if I were pressed, I'll at least speak for me. What are they about most fundamentally? They're about union with Christ. That's right. That's right. And, and so we've talked some about baptism and even more on the table. Think of Jesus in John chapter 6 with all of his language about the manna that your fathers ate in the wilderness. Well, what was the manna about? It was about Christ, because he says, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. I'm the true bread that comes down from heaven. And think about this, that the manna was bread from heaven that sustained God's people during their pilgrimage in the wilderness. Mm. Christ is the true bread from heaven that sustains his people as we are on our pilgrimage to the heavenly city. Mm. And the rock. Sure. The rock in the wilderness, because yeah. he, he referenced that as that I am the living water, right? The sustain. So it's yeah. about union with Christ. Christ sustains us, you know, and I think we see that in in the supper. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that you brought about the rock. You, you're referencing when when Moses struck the rock That's right. to bring about water. That Jesus is the rock. And Jesus says this because he interprets that yeah. passage and says that's about me. Well, and and think of it this way: right. Jesus is the rock that receives the blows of our disobedience mm. and yet pours forth the water of life. Right. Yeah. I don't think we're putting that on the text. because no. the, the, well, <laughs> Jesus did. Right. Jesus He's did. the one who interpreted that for us. Jesus does this stuff all the time. I mean, this is just fun for us to sit and, around and, and talk is, about. In the book, the book of John. John. Yeah, this is right. the book well, of John. You know, you, You'll find you, that in John. We're mentioning all this stuff in the book of John. Again, with Nicodemus, he talks about the snake that was raised up mm. in the wilderness, Numbers 21. 
Remember all the, the people had grumbled. That's God right. sends fiery serpents. People are getting bit. People are dying. That's right. So then he tells Moses, make a serpent out of bronze and put it on a, a pole and raise it up. Right. And when anybody looks to that snake that's lifted up, be saved. Christ says that that's me. That's what I'm coming to do. Just as the snake was lifted up. Right. Yeah. Types yeah. and shadows, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jesus is the good shepherd. Mm. Yeah. Ezekiel 34, the Lord says, I will be the shepherd of my people. Exactly I will seek right. them out. I will save them. I will set over them my servant David, and he will be their shepherd. Mm -hmm. And then Christ shows up saying, I'm the good shepherd. Yeah. That's right. So, so for those of you listening to this, and perhaps you're new, go with fresh eyes to the book of John and look at all of the I am statements of Christ. Mm -hmm. And now think of them with a fresh mindset yeah. that all the types and shadows of the Old Testament, Jesus is like, that's me. That's me. That's me. There That's I was. Me. Yeah. There I am. Yeah. I mean, the, the I am statements reference, you know, even, even, even the word I am, that is how God refers to himself, Yahweh. I am who I say I am. That's right. It, it's, it's of no little value that Christ says, I am this, I am that. Mm -hmm. And so guys, as we kind of kind of wrap up this entire series on mm -hmm. covenant theology, which has just been a whole lot of fun for us. <laughs> it has. <laughs> let's, we're descending into Theological the airport. Theological Disneyland right here. <laughs> That's right. We're descending into the airport. At the end of the day, who cares? Who cares about this? Why should we care about this? That's right. Why should we care about covenant theology? Well, it changes, and this is true of anyone who's ever engaged in it. It changes the way in which you interact with God and His Word. So when you go to the Word now, Very much. you are seeing how God fulfills the promise given to Eve. It's just page after page after page of God's faithfulness to prove that God can complete what he promises. So when you read it, you aren't reading, well, this is what I must do in order to please and honor God, because right. Israel proves no one can do that. Right. It is, this is what God did to save unsavable people. Like, they can't save themselves. This is why we say language like unconditional promise versus conditional. Mm -hmm. So your assurance yeah. is pushed towards God yeah. and away from you constantly. Word. I, why does this matter? It matters for assurance. It matters for rest and peace because we know as we understand scripture this way and as we look to God's word and we see these things that we've been talking about for several sessions now, we see that redemption has been planned by God, that it has been accomplished by God, and it has been applied to us by God through faith in Christ. Mm. And so then we, we realize with this covenantal framework that, that, again, comes out of the text, that there really is nothing left to do because we look at it and say, well, what else could be done? Christ has done everything. Mm. This was always about him. And everything that humanity has ever blown, Christ has recovered for us and has given to us. He has restored it all. You know, and he has saved us and rescued us from everything that we have done to ourselves through sin. Yeah. Well, I think also as we think about this, and, and John, you, you, you referenced this, when we think about covenant theology, it is, it is the key to the map of the Bible, mm -hmm. that it helps us to understand right. that the Scriptures are not there to make us morally improving people. The Scriptures right. are not there to give us a list of moral commands that we do and do not. Right. But rather, the scriptures are there to give us this grand drama of redemption that yeah. is revealed in types and shadows in the New Old Testament, but finally fulfilled mm -hmm. in Christ in the New. Yeah. That we look to and say, my goodness, <laughs> the Bible is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's not this obscure text, but the Bible is a history of redemption that I find myself in under right. the covenant of grace in Christ. Right. And in the narrative, as Israel had rules by which they would to live in the presence of God as new covenant members, as those under the covenant of grace, we too have been given uh, ways in which that we are to live and sure. conduct ourselves. As those who have received grace and love, we give grace and love, and, mm -hmm. and we are accomplishing those missions. So don't, I mean, sometimes people hear us say, well, covenant theology must not be about obedience at all. Well, of course not. Well, uh, actually it is. It's about Christ's obedience. That's right. <laughs> right, but my point is those who are part of the new covenant, right. we we do have ways in which we conduct ourselves, Absolutely. but it's never, as we say at Theocast, it's never to gain or maintain your entrance mm. into the new covenant. It's because you're in the new covenant. Yeah, it's yes. in light of your entrance. You, exactly. You're, you're, you and now, because of your entrance. That's right. You now live. Yeah. I mean, exactly. think, think of the whole idea of adoption. If you were to adopt a child, right, you wouldn't right. look at that child and say, 
hey, you better behave yourself right. if you want to be a Bueller or you exactly. want to be a Purdue or you want to be a Moffat. Yeah. Exactly. No, you would say, no, because you are my son. Exactly. Because I have adopted you into this family. This is this is who you are now. Right. Right. And something that I say to, to our church all the time is that when God calls us to live, or dare I say behave in particular ways, he's calling to he's calling you to live in light of who he's already declared you to be. Mm. Yeah. That that is the beauty of adoption. Yeah. I I'm going to come back to one final thought for me. And we talk a lot about the sufficiency of Jesus. Uh, covenant theology has everything to do with that. And we we use the phrase in our church a lot that Christ is enough. And that's right. what we mean. And, and that flows out of and comes from this covenantal understanding that Christ is enough to save. He is able to save. He is mighty to save. And he has saved us. And Horatius Bonar has a a lot of great things to write and say, but he has a, a little anecdote that's really cool about writing about an anxious soul who has no peace before the Lord. And he goes through this, this, this story of all these things that this person is doing to try to find peace before God. Surely this will do. Surely this will do. Surely this will do. I'll do this and then I'll have peace. And the conclusion that this person comes to at some point after he's done all these things is none of these things will do, mm. but Christ will do. That's right. And Amen. for me... Christ will do. It, it comes from this covenantal understanding of Scripture. Amen. Well, we pray that there may have been a spark to bring your hope alive and to make the Bible actually enjoyable, to give it structure. Uh, it's beautiful. It's glorious. And the hope that we have in Scripture is that one day, as Isaiah 11 says, we will live with the King in his glorious land of rest. Amen. And we pray that you find that. Uh, we want to thank you for going through this journey with us, and we're going to ask if you can. We would love to produce more series like this, but it does cost money. And if you've enjoyed this and you have the means, we'd ask you to help support or donate so that we can provide more um, education series like this. Thanks for listening. <laughs>